Hello, my name is Sadia Hendrickson. I've been teaching mathematics at the University of Toronto for over a decade and tutoring high school and university students for even longer. I've also been a student of mathematics for practically my entire life. Now, that number of years, I'll leave to your imagination. But throughout my math journey, both as a student and as an educator, I have learned many lessons, some of them the hard way. And before you watch the videos in these modules, I have some very important things to tell you. Now, I know your time is precious, so I'll try not to take too long, but this information or the lack of it can determine just how much you benefit from all of the videos that will follow. The goal is to show you how to engage with the modules in a way that will save you time, while also maximizing how much you learn and improving how you feel while learning. Now, this will be done over the course of four chapters, so let's take a look at what they are. For chapter one, we are going to explore beliefs, attitudes, and feelings associated with math. Why? Because our beliefs, attitudes, and feelings influence our behaviors, and our behaviors have a major effect on our learning and performance in math. In chapter two, we're going to discuss possible definitions of the word mathematics and what is needed to become proficient in math. The why here is because if we don't clearly identify what is required for us to be successful, how will we know which steps to take? Chapter two really sets us up for chapter three, because once we know our definitions of math and what we need to be proficient, we can describe a roadmap for success. And the goal is to see a concrete approach to learning mathematics that makes it more accessible and, dare I say, more enjoyable. And finally, in chapter four, we are going to discuss active learning strategies that help us leap that is, learn efficiently, actively, and purposefully, and we'll preview a resource that offers guidance on using index cards effectively. While all of the chapters are very important, chapter two is particularly special because it will establish definitions for the words mathematics and math proficiency that will guide everything that we do moving forward. It'll also show that our plan for success in chapter three is not wishy-washy, but is actually legit and informed by research. So to see why chapter two is relevant, let's take a look at a quick example. Suppose we are learning how to drive. At the most basic level, we have to know that to drive means to operate and control the direction and speed of a motor vehicle. But the definition alone is not enough. It doesn't tell us anything about how to drive. And as with most things that we try to learn in life, the hard and inconvenient truth is that the how is usually much more technical and challenging, but at the same time, it is absolutely necessary if we want to become proficient. And the New Oxford American Dictionary defines proficient as competent or skilled in doing or using something. Not knowing how to be a proficient driver has consequences, with the most obvious being getting into an accident or causing others to get into an accident. Some examples of consequences include property damage, for example, damaging the car or any other object that is involved in the collision, or serious injuries where you or any other person involved may require urgent care at a hospital. In the context of math, not knowing what math is and how to be a proficient student may also have serious consequences. Some examples of consequences include not being able to study effectively and losing a lot of time that could have been spent doing other things, difficult experiences in school, college, or university math courses that compromise our mental health, for example, high levels of stress, anxiety, despair, and so on, and reduced access to academic and career opportunities 
that are connected to personal fulfillment and socioeconomic progress. Now, there is a lot here in this third bullet point. So let's look at this one a bit more closely. What does math have to do with access to other academic and career opportunities? Well, one example that I've seen many times before is a student may take the minimum amount of math that is needed to get their high school diploma. For example, let's say three credits from grades 9, 10, and 11 because they feel very confident that their future career goals won't require more math. But then later, they are shocked and even devastated by the amount of college or university programs that require that students have completed more high school math to be even accepted and or require that students take more math as a part of the program requirements. A specific example is a psychology program, for example, at the University of Toronto may require that students take a grade 12 math course because the program will also require students to take statistics, which is a branch of applied mathematics. On this slide, I have six different trades written in bold and in purple are examples of jobs that are related to each of these trades programs. Now, all of these require some level of math, and there are many more examples. This is not an exhaustive list. So I'm going to ask that you pause the video right now just so that you can take a closer look at what is written here. On this slide, all of these also need math. And here are college or university programs written in bold and in purple are examples of jobs that are related to these programs. And again, this is not an exhaustive list. There are many more, but I encourage you to pause the video again just so that you can read these examples more closely. Now that we have a better understanding of the connection between mathematics and reduced access to academic and career opportunities, I just want to highlight two more phrases in this statement. The first is personal fulfillment. And I want you to imagine a student who is so terrified of taking math at the college or university level, or a student who actually attempts to take a course but struggles so much that they abandon their program and their dream of becoming something like a doctor, an engineer, an architect, etc. Now, in my experience as an educator, I have seen this happen many times and it is heartbreaking. The second phrase is socioeconomic progress. And the word socioeconomic is a term that connects to someone's social, educational, health, and financial resources. Now, we've already seen how not knowing math and how to be proficient at it affects our access to trades programs and numerous other college or university programs, but this is directly connected to access to work and specifically jobs with a living wage. And when I say living wage, I'm talking about an hourly wage that is high enough to cover basic living expenses like shelter and food. So here, I want you to imagine growing up in a family where your parents or guardians had limited access to educational and financial resources, which made it difficult for them to take care of you. Then when you got older, you experienced similar challenges and struggled to support yourself and your family. This is an example of an intergenerational cycle of poverty. And while the reasons why these cycles arise are complex, it's clear that having limited access to educational and career opportunities simply makes it harder to break them. The phrase knowledge is power may sound a bit cheesy, but it is very relevant here. If mathematics has felt inaccessible in your past, my goal is to give you the knowledge that you need to just do it differently from now on. I want you to be able to approach it in a way that is more doable, uh, more calculated, more productive, and even more enjoyable. 
And if you already feel like you have a pretty healthy relationship with math, then you'll just gain knowledge to make your experience all the more meaningful and beneficial. On this slide, I would like you to think about words and feelings that come to mind when you hear mathematics. And then if you could jot them down either on this slide in the box that you see or on your own sheet of paper, just so that you can get a rough sense of your current relationship with mathematics. So if you could pause the video and create your word cloud now, we'll be right back. Here I have a spectrum, and on both ends of the spectrum we see word clouds. So on the left, we're seeing that the words that are most noticeable seem to be associated with unpleasant thoughts and difficult emotions, whereas on the right, we're seeing words that are connected to more pleasant thoughts and productive emotions. Now, the thing is, is that if we zoom into these word clouds, we actually find that they have the same words. They just vary in size. So on the left, even though we're seeing more unpleasant thoughts and difficult emotions dominate, we're still seeing words like confidence and resilience show up in the cloud. And on the right, where we're thinking about more positive thoughts and productive emotions, we're seeing words like shame, irrelevant, and anxiety appear. Now, why is it that even though these clouds are on separate ends of the spectrum, they have all of the same words. Well, it connects to the idea that our experiences in math are pretty complex, right? And we likely have thoughts and feelings that are more or less pleasant, difficult, or productive, depending on what's going on at any given moment. So a good example is to think about the word anxiety. Even if we feel like we tend to more often than not have more pleasant thoughts and productive emotions in our math experience, anxiety doesn't just disappear, right? If we're learning a new topic, it's unfamiliar, we might experience some anxiety as we are playing with different exercises or writing a quiz or a test on the content. But as we get more proficient, that anxiety would likely decrease. And the thing that I think is important is the word dominate, right? So even if we're experiencing the anxiety, it's not so overwhelming that it is deteriorating and disrupting our learning experience. Another thing is that these clouds can have words that are the same, but they have very different meaning depending on where we are on the spectrum, right? So if we're on the left end of the spectrum, we might associate the word abstract with very intimidating algebraic expressions or lots of variables that make us feel like the math is very hard. But if we become more proficient in math, we start to realize very quickly that playing with variables, working with algebraic expressions, exploring and finding patterns that we can generalize is actually where most of our power lies in mathematics. And we get excited to work in the abstract. So what I want you to do is to think about your word cloud and just compare it with the ones I have here on the spectrum and ask yourself, would I position myself furthest to the left, maybe closer to the left, in the middle, closer to the right, or at the rightmost end of the spectrum? So if you could pause and reflect, we'll be back momentarily. So why does it matter anyway? Well, I think most people would probably agree that the right end of the spectrum supports a more healthy, enjoyable, and successful journey in math. But it's important for us to discuss concrete reasons why we should work towards actually moving in the direction towards the right if we aren't already there. So the first important reason for wanting to move towards the right end of the spectrum is that research indicates that beliefs, attitudes, and feelings influence students' behaviors. And we don't really need research to tell us this. Our personal experiences serve as constant reminders that our beliefs, attitudes, and feelings are directly tied to our energy levels and motivation, as well as how much time and effort we're willing to put towards certain tasks, responsibilities, or goals. The second important reason is that our behaviors impact our ability to learn math. 
But why are our behaviors so important? Well, the answer is that math is a very active discipline. You can't just sit and absorb it. Mathematics requires us to constantly engage with it, to understand it, to apply it, and to create more knowledge in it. So to learn it effectively, there are lots of things that we must do. And if you recall the example that we talked about earlier about driving, we can say something very similar. You can't learn how to drive by simply reading about it or listening to someone describe how to do it or even by watching someone drive. You have to actually sit in the driver's seat and apply what you've read, heard, and seen. For example, pressing down on the pedals with your feet or turning the steering wheel. The important and natural follow-up question is, what are these things that we have to do to learn math better? Finding the answer actually requires a bit of care, so we'll discuss it in detail over the next three chapters.